We had a good time too, didn't we? Yeah, You've only been fishing buddy. with him once. <laughs> Just once? Oh, yeah, right. that's the last time. That's First and last. last. Uh -huh. I never will forget that. I put, I loaded up a case of beer and had it iced down. And got on to Ed's house to pick him up, and he's. He had a case of beer. I said, we don't need that, Ed. Hell, I got a case of beer. Well, let's take it just in case. And before it was over with, we got some six packs and we we'll let get home on. And it took us from 9, what was it, about 9.30 in the morning? 9.30 to 5.30 to get back to Bob Hall Pier. From Big Chill. Oh, that was a good story. Well, I don't know. 9.30. Yeah, they were just lucky. There was lots of driftwood on the beach. And old, old Ed. <laughs> old Ed <laughs> built a road. And guess who built the road? <laughs> And old engineer Ed here, he steps up on, walks up on top of that bluff, he's about to die down. And he said, "How we can get that thing out?" And I said, "You're out of your mind." <laughs> Hell, it was just slowly. In fact, when I got stuck, it rooted up shell and it came back through the grill against the radiator. And, uh, and so Ed opened the door and when he opened the door on his side, a wave hit it, came through the floor board. <laughs> Jellyfish and stuff was stinging our legs, you know, from the floor. And uh, anyway, we built, built the wall all the way around. And uh, it was, by then, it was setting the bottom. What the fuck? It's that 56 board pick. That's the one that's buzzing now. And uh, I'm glad you anyway, said. I, I, after we got the fence built around, I said, all right, smart Alec, now what are we going to do? All I had was that old screw jack thing, you know. There's no way you could use that. And he said, well, we need to cut some more boards now. And I said, what do you mean cut some boards? Well, we had a axe with us. And you cut boards about that long, and you be sure you drive them all the same way under the cars. And you drive, get around in front of the tire and drive that board in and overlap. Where it, you be sure they overlap the same way all the way around. And then I'd get in it, and Ed told me what to do. Oh, I'd put it in reverse and ride the clutch, you know, as a standard chin, and hold it, and it just barely move, but while it moved, backwards, Ed would drive all those boards under there. And then, then, I'd put, then, I'd put, then I'd put it in drive, then I'd put it in drive, and put it in forward, and you'd drive the backboard. And by doing that, you just gradually pick it up down there, a little bit at a time. It took a while, but picked it up out, and I would have never thought of it. But how did you get it up? How did y'all get it on the bluff? Well, oh, 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 I'll help you get that. We laid some boards for about, we picked out a place down there. It was kind of what? Many boards we could find. And, and we, made uh, road. We, we made a road out of boards and got up there and dug it up there and slammed it. Just shut it. Dug it down and rode right back up on it. Get on the boards and then he'd go as far as he could. And I was standing on the rear bumper. Bouncing out the whole time. And the old lady got stuck again. And it wasn't tight on the boards. Well, we all just moved back. And that's why I went there with the wind. I was doing the road from Little Shell all the way to Robert Pass. Come on, it wasn't that bad. That's why it took so much beer. What did you do with your wife? That one time, that one time, Ed was back there bouncing Hell, he'd been doing it for about two miles. You know, and that thing just crow hopping through that soft sand. And he finally, his leg, he just got tired, period. And he hollered, and he hollered at me and said, Whoa, stop. Well, you, that's a must. Once he quits bouncing, you stop before he quits bouncing or it's going to sink all the way down. And so I stopped, and he got off, and he walked around the, to the passenger side and picked up off about 20 feet. Here he was. <laughs> And I hollered at him too. I said, I stepped out the steering wheel smoking a cigarette. And I said, Hey, Ed, while you're out there, would you mind getting me a beer? Out? <laughs> and he blew up. All he had to do was drive. Just <laughs> up. I imagine next time you decided you were going to take your car. Oh, well, yeah, and he missed a very important. You uh, were selling insurance. Yeah. You, had, you were supposed to meet with somebody at 5 o'clock. Yeah. And you didn't make it. Well, you know what they
they say in every stock you have to get a four wheel drive to pull you out. That's true. Trust me, all the way out there. Well, but that day, if it hadn't been for it, I'll guarantee you, that, that picture. Well, we didn't catch right a fish. Was, <laughs> oh, that's right. No, not one fish. We would have never had a beach buggy or a hunting buggy or anything. No, no thank you, right. man. <laughs> <laughs> I still got a scar from my hunting buggy. Hey, don't blame it on me. I didn't design it. On the bumper? <laughs> I did not design it. Who designed it? that? Mike? Mike and Bill. Uncle Bill. Bill and then Pat. Pat chopped on the bottom. 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 You weren't, you weren't the one who shot the ball in the mill house, were you? No, I don't. You got to be kidding. Yeah, come on, come on, Frankie. Don't blow your danger down. Somebody asked me this evening, when was the maddest I ever got a daddy? And I thought back about the trench. Now, if you grew up in the Davis family, all you have to do is say the trench, and everybody in the immediate family knows exactly what you're talking about. But briefly, for those of you who don't know, it was a trench that was dug with a plow all the way around the house, and in that trench were planted shrubs about every foot or so. And it was the job of the three boys to make sure that there was no grass in that trench ever. Now, I didn't know it at the time. I know it now that that was really nothing more than busy work. It didn't have to be done. There was no reason for it to be done. But yet, we had to do the trench. And we'd get out there, and we'd get dirt underneath our nails, and our fingers would bleed, and we'd get blisters, and we'd be out in the heat, and we'd be in the sun all day long. And I remember one time in particular, we were over here on the west side of the house, where Dad's porch is, where Dad sits on the porch, and Mike and I were out there, I don't know where Pat was, he was sloughing off, he wasn't helping, but we were out there and we were digging around in the trench. We'd been out there all day, our fingers were bleeding, we had blisters, we were hot, we were thirsty, and we felt like we were being punished for being out there on the trench. All of a sudden we hear this laughter coming from somewhere, and we recognize that it's Dad, and we look up and there's Dad sitting on his west porch laughing his head off, getting all of his fishing tackle together so he can go fishing. Needless to say, we got mad, and that was about the maddest that we ever got. But I have to admit that before he left, he invited us to go with him, and he got us off the trench, so we got a reprieve that day. That was the maddest I ever got. The maddest you ever got at death. The maddest I ever got at death. We were cutting grain on Hubert Snyder's field. I'll never forget. And I was junior high and in, in, in high school. I mean, junior high. And... Uh, we were cutting over there, and there was this big water hole over there. And and Dad took me down there. I think he did, and he said, "Now, Pat, whatever you do, don't get this combine next to this water hole. Just cut around it. You, <laughs> you would understand." He says, "I remember. I remember this." He says, "Do not get close to that water hole." Well, back then, mm -hmm. the 403 was a big combine. I mean, that was our prime. Was and so what did I do? I went down to the pond and, and I got stuck. And, and you know, I was just trying to help Hubert out, you know, get as much grain as possible out of the field. And uh, that was probably, there's a backside of this, this is probably the maddest I've ever seen dead. <laughs> Not only was I mad at him, he was very mad at me for getting the oil tree stuff. And I remember this quotation, he said, son, if we get that combine out before the spring thaw, no, the ground's going to have to freeze before we get that combine <laughs> out of the ground. That's what he said. <laughs> and I'll never forget, Hubert Snyder hooked up to that combine, to the back end of it, and we just pulled it right out of the mud. And Dad yelled at me for 30 minutes, probably an hour, that we weren't going to get that combine out until the ground froze. <laughs> and we pulled it out, and uh, he started apologizing up and down, and I thought, I was sitting there in the pickup seat right with him, and I thought, no, I'm not going to let you get away with this, but that's probably the maddest item. Well, it's only fair since I, I've told you the maddest ever was a dad, and I've also told you uh, the most embarrassed I was around dad. I guess it's only fair to tell you the proudest that I ever was a dad. <clears throat> when I was in college, up until the time I was a junior, I'd always come home and work on the farm. But after my, uh, or excuse me, sophomore, after my sophomore year, Dad got me a job out at American Smelting. 
And they always had a lot of summer positions out there. I'd say they had at least 12 each summer. But they always had one job that was the push job for the summer workers, the summer college workers. <laughs> and it was in the personnel department out at American Smelter. And you really had to have some stroke and have to pull a few strings to get that job because everybody wanted their son to work in the personnel department. Well, somehow, Dad got me in there, and I got that job the first summer. But that's not what I was proud of him about. <clears throat> the reason I was proud of him is that in the two summers that I worked there, I never could get any work done. Because this is no joke, every day, at least two people in the morning and two people in the afternoon would come through, and I mean a lot more people than that came through, but out of that crowd, at least two in the morning and two in the afternoon would have to take me aside and tell me how honorable he was, how honest he was, how hard-working he was, <laughs> how decent he was, how honored I should be to be his son. And that didn't go on just for the first week of the first summer, and it didn't go on for the first half of the first summer. It went on the entire first summer, and it went on the entire second summer. And if anything, it got worse as time went on. It got to the point where I was embarrassed because I'd find that we'd be sitting around, two or three of us, and we'd be talking about my dad, and we wouldn't be getting any work done. But these were guys that he had worked with for years. Uh, he had known them uh, just as long as he had known me because many of these guys started working at that plant the same time he did, which was about the time that I came along. And it just made me proud to hear these guys take time out of their day consistently, two summers straight, to tell me what a fine man my father was. And that's the proudest I ever was. Happy birthday! <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, James, to a special guy who means a lot to me. Yeah, it was a great filming this for you, and it meant a lot being here, and I'm glad you're still around, and I hope my son gets to know you real well. I love you, and happy birthday. Happy birthday.